What's good? What's good? It looks like the thing is working now. And... All right. Welcome again to another reading. And this particular um, chapter, y'all gonna probably like the most. Um, I think we all heard of the Nat Turner rebellions, and there was actually a book. Talking about Nat Turner's Confessions, which I have not really looked into, um, but I know it exists. Um, so for those who have read it or don't read it, I will still advocate to read it anyway because it does talk about serpents of certain confessions that he gave to the same, I guess, man that was wanting to know why he did what he did. I always tell you, be careful of the other underlying propaganda that was, um, I think, was re edit. And I buy um I think what's his name? It's a black writer. Um, I can't, it slipped my mind. I forgot his name again. But y'all know who I'm talking about. Um, yeah, what's good? I'm trying to remember his name again. Um, ooh. If anybody knows his name, please write in the chat. But you know, he wrote he, he is a homosexual back in the early twentieth century. Um he wrote books about, you know, black people's situation, you know, racism. If anybody knows his name, please tell me. Um I can't remember again. Um but like I said, uh yeah, he was one of those men that um wrote to re edit um, and put in the homosexual part of um, Nat Turner proclaiming that he was gay uh, nonsense. But we all not not true at that time. And let's say if it was true, right? If if they want to go by that narrative, right? What importance is that to mention that in his confessions? Or try to put that in, in his confessions to make up that? That was my, my number one question. And mind you, the confession of Nat Turner was republicized re more than I think once. So if you never got the original um confession of Nat Turner, you if you gave it as a second or third edition, that's I think that's when they really edit and put that piece in it. Now mind you, this is what I heard. I can't I can't say that it validated because I never read the Nat Turner Confessions. But for the sake of conversation, you know. Be careful what you read. You know, that's all I gotta say. You gotta be very careful. Be very careful. So as I find the page, we will begin. And like always, as you come in the stream or in the podcast, please like this video. Um also if you're not subscribed to Chaos Rang, what you're waiting for, hit that notification bell. You know, and we have three options. Depending on the three options you pick, will determine how often I go live or upload. And always leave a comment to every stream, every video of this podcast or any other broadcast to let me know how you feel, your expressions, your thoughts, feelings. And I will eventually reply back to those who, you know, give the um, comments. You know, so. And it depends on the comment. I will give you a reply back. So don't be hesitant. So I give people less than a minute. Then I'll begin. All right. As I begin, um, to let anybody know that's listed, if you have any response or comments as I'm streaming now, on have you ever got a chance to go back to some of the previous broadcasts of the American Negro Slave Revolts? Let me know. All right. 
Let us begin. This is titled Chapter 12 The Turner Catism. It has already been demonstrated that the decade preceding the Southampton insurrection was one of the economic depressions throughout the South and in the Old South, especially Eastern Virginia and Eastern North Carolina, it was marked by a dangerous disproportionating rate of population growth that of the Negroes distinctly outstripping that of the whites to completely the picture of environmental conditions one should examine the specific locale of Turner's uprising. So as you know, we're going further. Southampton is a tidewater county located in the southeastern part of Virginia, bordering the state of North Carolina, cover 600 square miles. It was an important economic unit in the Tidewaters areas. In 1830, it was second in the state in its production of potatoes and rice, and in 1840, was the leading county in cotton production in the valley of its orchard produce and in its number of the swine its population trend was that of the section of a more rapid growth of the negroes than of the white elements thus one find that whites are or while in 1800s there were 600 or actually 6,127 whites and 8,043 Negroes in South Hampton County. In 1830, the figures read 6,574 whites and 9,501 Negroes. In 1830, out of the total of 39 Tidewaters counties, only three surpassed Southampton in the number of free Negroes and only four in the number of slaves and in the number of whites. Now, let us pause right there for a second. Let's do a number. So, in the period of, mm, looks like roughly 30 years, there was a growth. So, how I many out of the Negroes, let's do the numbers. If there were 9,501 subtracted by 600, five, 6,574, what's the ratio? You're looking at roughly almost 2,927 more Negroes than whites during that span of roughly 10 to 20 years. Maybe three. And as you know, like anything in warfare, numbers are very important. They always got to know how many numbers of Negroes, not only in this soil, but out the globe. Because obviously when you have more numbers, it becomes a problem because now you don't want a certain people to start get understand of the game and awakening and want to take back control. So keep that in mind. Knowing that they control mostly of the Negro mind they have to worry about his actions but always they always got to keep the numbers down as best as possible because the more negroes the more the problem with anyone will be let's say get in their uppity mood to, they want to don't want to be a slave during them times in the in this economic decline southampton is also typically of the conditions in eastern virginia during the period thus the example it ranks fifth in the state in 1800 and the amount of taxes it paid on the assets validation of its land and lot but dropping to 44 and 8 that I'm um, 1820 and to 46 in 1830 the situation then in the decades prior to the Southampton revolt is one of the extraordinary 
my last say in the slaveholding eras. It is marked by considering expansion and deplo deployment of anti-slavery feelings, nationality, and internationality. As part of an all-embracing upsurge of progressive and radical thoughts and actions throughout the Western world, by great and serious unrest among the slave population in the West Indies as well <coughs> as well as on the continent by several economic depressions and by the more rapid growth of the Negro population and the whites through the old South testifying to the uneasiness of the master class there appears numerous precautionary measurements for the purpose of over raveling or further restricting of the activities of the slave population, which in turn very likely stimulate discontent. And as a last resort, in order to assure the speedy suppression of all evidence of slave insubordination, it was into such a situation one of the attempts to assert through or thought proof is of course not in land or not at hand that it, it was because of such a situation that the uprising dark arms of vengeance of Turner and his followers crashed in the summer of 1831. Nat Turner was born October the 2nd, 1800, and apparently lived all his life in Southampton County at the time of the rebellions he was and a sub side note here which you could read for yourself five foot six or eight inches high weigh between 150 and 160 pounds rather bright complexion but not a mulatto board shoulders or broad shoulders Large, flat nose, large eyes, broad, flat feet, rather knock, knee, walks, bris I think it's called brisket, and active hair, or, or an active, hair on the top of the head, very thin, no beard except on the upper lip and the top of the chin, a scar on one of his temples, also one on the back of his neck, a large knot on one of his bones on his right arm near the wrist produced by a blow. So as you know, that's the description of um, Nat Turner. And I'm not sure if anybody else gave in his confessions what he looked like. But during that time, you know, by other sources, they know what he actually looked like. So if you never heard it here, you heard it here first. Very natural, Williams Lloyd Garrison, in commenting upon this description, point to those scars as important ex explanation for Turner's acti actions. But the Richmond Inquiry assures its readers that Turner got two of his bruises in fights with fellow slaves and one of them that of his temple Though a mule kick, jury, notwithstanding the fact that his description of turn hardly indicate a pergracious individual, accept the explanation of the Southern newspaper and point out correctly that Turner himself stated that his last ma master, Joseph Travis, had not been severe, but he had had other. Masters, Benjamin Turner, Putman Monroe, and he had in 1826 or 1827 run away from one of these after a change in overseers. However, that may be more personal vengeance was not Nat Turner's motive. He had learned how to read precisely when he did not know and when his labor permitted he had immersed himself 
in the stories of the Bible. He was a keen mechanical gift man whose religion offers him a rationalization for his opposition to the status quo. Later writers have described him as an overseer or foreman and while no convictions of supported for this has been found. It is certain that his considerable mental ability were recognized and appreciated by his contemporaries. He was a religious leader, often conducted service of a Baptist nature and exhorted his follower workers. It appears that even white people were influenced, if not controlled by him, so that, as he said, he immersed one either heard T. Bailey and prevail upon him to cease from his work wickedness. So they quote. Turner became convinced that he was obtained for some great purpose in the hands of the Almighty. In the spring of 1828, while working in the fields, he heard a loud noise in the heavens, and the spirits instantly appeared to me and said the serpent was loosening and Christ had laid down the yoke he had borne for the sins of men and that I should take it on and fight against the serpent for the time was fast approaching when the first should be the last and the last should be the first you know that's a Bible verse the slave waited for a sign from his God this came to him in the form of a solar eclipse of February 12th, 1831. And there's a subtitle on the bottom that deals more of Nat Turner, which you can read for yourself. Then, apparently, for the first time, he told four other slaves of his plans for rebellion. All joined him, and these American Negroes selected the 4th of July as the day of which to strike for liberty and choice, which led a later commentary to curse them because they had perverted that sacred day. Turner was ill on the scarred day, and the conspir conspirators waited for another sign. This appeared to them on Saturday, August the 13th, in the greenest blue color of the sun. According to Drury, Turner the next day exhorted at a religious meeting of Negroes in the so southern parts of Southampton County, not in North Carolina as has been said, where some of the slaves significantly their willingness to cooperate with him by wearing around their necks red bandanas, handkerchiefs, there was certainly a meeting of Plotner in the afternoon of Sunday, August the 21st, and it was then decided to start the revolt and that evening. And as y'all know, a lot, lot of times of certain revolutions usually happen roughly around the summertime, I believe, on the average. But like I said, um, those were the times at that time um, when certain revolts happened mostly. Appreciating the value of a dramatic entrance, Turner was the last to join this gathering. He noticed a newcomer in the group and declared, and this is what you quote, I salute them on coming up and ask, will, how can be there? Be answered, his life was worth no more than others and his liberty as dear to him. I asked him if he meant to obtain it. He said he would or loosen his life. This was enough to put him in full confidence. <clears throat> These six slaves then started out 
in the evening of August 21st, 1831, on their crusade against bondage. Their first blow, delivered by Turner himself, struck against persons and families of Turner's master, Joseph Travis, who were killed. Some arms and horses were taken. The rebellions pushed on, and everywhere slaves flocked to their standard, a result which Turner started out with but a handful of followers must have had excellent reasons to anticipate. Within 24 hours, approximately 70 slaves were actively aiding in the rebellion, or what do you call rebel? Yeah, rebellion. By the morning of August 23rd, at least 57 whites, even women and children, had been killed, and the rebellion had covered about 20 miles. And there's a subtitle to this one. You know, maybe I should read the subtitle since I'm on this. Let's look closer. The confessions of the priests, especially Richmond Inquiry and Richmond Whig, are the basic source for the proceeding of the rebellion itself, bearing in mind, of course, that all are hostile to the cause of Turner's expose, expose. No attempts will be made to detail these since accuracy is impossible. Moreover, Drury made an attempt in fourth pages and in the, his account entered the realm of fantasy and when he declares, and this is page 35, that one infant was temporarily spared because it sweetly smiled as it ascends a search for Joseph Travis' name and his land of uh, property books were unsuccessful. However, Joseph Travis was married in Southampton County on October the 5th, 1829 to Sarah W. Monroe, perhaps the widow of Putman Monroe, a former owner of Nat Turner, MS Marriage Register, Southampton in 1750 to 1853. Part 2, page 402, the Southampton Land Book for 1831 does like a Benjamin Travis as the owner of 250 acres worth within the building, about $695, some 15 miles north of Jerusalem, a paid Travis owner of two acres of land worth $24 is also listed. It was later claimed that some of these slaves were forced to join this as possible, though Turner never now were mentioned anything like that. As Thomas Wentworth Higginson pointed out, that turn insurrection of the Atlantic Monthly um, of eight, it was to be expected that once the movement had been crushed, that would be offered as an extensionary circumstance. Neither contemporary nor later contemporaries agree as to the number of casualties or of here of discrepancies, especially great the number of rebellions detailed evidence for the estimate made above cover several pages of the press, writers, masters, thesis, Nat Turner Revolt, Columbia University, um, one, 1936. Well, actually, that's 19, 1937. The death alone met the victims of the slaves' vengeance and the wrath of historians find great difficulty in according, or according for the fact that so far as the evidence shown, there was no instance of rape or attempt rape by Turner's followers. R. R. Everson or Elwison is reduced to say, remembering the brutal passion of the Negroes, we can only account for... Now, when I read that little section, subpar section, from paragraphs 1, 2, 2, 3, because with any revolt, there are serious casualties where 
there are the historian will give a vague number how many casualties, but they never really know because they were never there at that time, as everybody know. They only go by the bodies and what was claimed how many were dead during this rebellion by Nat Turner. There was no rape. So when they talk about this thing about the black man wants to, you know, rape, they don't have the same mindset as the non blacks, Europeans. And why I mean that mindset like that during them time. Because if we look at regular world history, the European history, lack of better words, what's evident what is shown when he comes to New Atlanta territory. What are three what are the three stages of colonization? Rape, plunder, pillage. And throughout his history, when he explored the world, when he got a chance to explore the world, that's what he done. Batman has not shown no evidence. Even during a time when he was conditioned to be a slave back then and even some now, today, you don't see when he rebels. That he wants an inclination to sit there after he goes and takes his frustrations on, you know, children and men, women also. He does go in and start raping. And that's not in his psychology. And really that proves this right here. During the, not only in that terms rebellions, but other rebellions that slaves took during them time. But let's continue. Turner declared that indiscriminately. Slaughter was not their intention after they obtained a foothold and was resorted to the first instance to strike terror and alarm. Women and children would afterwards have been spared and men too who ceased to resist. According to Governor John Floyd, the slaves spared but one family and that was one of the rich as to be in all respect upon a par with them. In the morning of the 23rd, Turner and his followers set out for the county seat of Jerusalem, where there was a considerable story, a store of arms. When about three miles from the town, several of the slaves, enough withstanding Turner objections, insisted upon trying to recruit the slaves for of a wealthy planter named Parker. <clears throat> Isn't that funny? Nate Parker played Nat Turner in the you know the movie Reformation back in 2016, I believe. Yeah. Turner, with a handful of followers, remained at the park gate while the rest went to the home itself. Above half a mile away, once at the park home, many of the slaves appear to have slacked their first form. It was well stocked sellers. And there's also a subtitle here, which you can read for yourself. And to have rested, Turner became impatient and set out to get his tardy companion. The eighth or the ninth slave remained at the gate were then attacked by voluntary corps of whites of about twice their numbers. The slaves retreated by upon being reinforced by returning Turner and his men. The rebellious press on the force of whites to give around and the whites to give ground. The later, however, were in turn reinforced by a company of militants and the Negroes whose Guns, according to the Richmond compiler of August 29th, were not fit for use. Fled. Though Turner later tried to round up significant followers to continue to struggle, his efforts were futile, and this battle at Parker Field was the crucial one. Late in the day of this encounter, the commander of Fort Monroe Colony Isusis was requested by the mayor of Norfolk to send him or to send aid. By the morning of the 24th, three companies of 
exhort exhortary with a field piece and one hundred stand of spare arms together with detachments of men from the warships warrant and attached were on their way to the skeins of the trouble. They made the six mile in one day and met hundreds of other soldiers from volunteers and mulattoes or actually militants, sorry, companies of the country in Virginia and in North Carolina surrounding Southampton. Massacres follow. Philip simply notes a certain number of incidents black shot down and Balgage asserts a must imperial trial, trial <coughs> impartial trial was given to all except a few decapitized in Southampton. While jury thought there was far less of this indiscriminate murder than might have been expected. Just how much indiscriminate murders one ought to expect is not clear, but the statements by General Epps to offer in commands of the effective county lead one to believe that these historians were rather uncritical in dealing with the phase of the events. He, the general, will not significate all of the incidents that he is bound to believe have occurred, but pass in silence and what has happened with the expression of the deepest sorrow that may necessarily should be supposed to have existed to justify a single act of autocracy. But he feels himself bound to declare and thereby announce to the troops and citizens that no excuse will be allowed for any similar acts of violence. After the per mongration of this order and the further of to declare in the most explicit terms that any who may attempt the rep reputation of such acts should be punished if necessary by the rigors of the articles of war. The course of has been pursued and he fears will in some instance be the means of rendering doubtful and the goal of those who may have participated in the carnage. This course of proceedings dignified the rebellion and assassinate with the sacrifice of martyrdom and confound the difference that morally and religiously may, uh, makes between the ruffian and the brave and the honorable. The editor of the Richmond Wiggles, or Richmond W. Hinks, also refer with pain to this feature of the Southampton Rebellion. We allude to the slaughter of many blacks without trial and under circumstance of great barbarity. He thought that about 40 had thus been killed, and Reverend G. W. Powell write, writ, writing August 27 when the reign of terror was by no means over reported. Many Negroes are killed every day. The exact number will never be known. The reference gentleman was correct, but it appears certain that more and many more than 40 were massacred. The Huntsville, Alabama Southern Advocates of October 15, 1831 declared that over 100 Negroes had been killed in Southampton. It seems accurate to say that at least twice as many Negroes were indiscriminately slaughtered in that county. As a number of white people who had fallen victim to the vengeance and bondage hating spirits of the slave that some considered themselves martyrs their lives in such a cause. And a later to judge Thomas Ruffinan of North Carolina declared some of them that were wounded and in agonies of death declared that they was going happy for that God had a hand 
and what they had been doing. Mm. No. Nat Turner elude his pursuit from the end of August until October 30th. When he was caught armed only when an old sword by Benjamin Phillips And during those weeks, there had been rumored that he was caught, that he was a runaway in Maryland, that he was drowned. But as a matter of fact, he never left his native county. He forestock his hiding place only a night for water, having supplies himself with food. Turner was was tried and thought pleading not guilty since, as he said, he did not feel guilty. He was condoned to hanging. And the uh, Honorable Jeremiah Cope pronounced sentencing on November the 5th in this word. The judgment of courts is that you be taken hence to the jail from whom you came tensence to the place of execution and on Friday next between the hours of 10 of 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. be hung by the neck until you are dead 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 and may the Lord have mercy upon your soul about 16 other slaves and three free Negroes had previously been executed and on November the 11th, 1831, their leader, the prophet, who, or he who had inspired them to value liberty upon life, went calmly to his death. Some of the first contemporary accounts of the revolts stated that it was led by about three whites, but these was later denied, and no good evidence had been seen to demonstrate that of any but Negroes were implicated in the uprising itself. There is now, or there is, however, evidence of joint activities in the trouble and plots immediately following the outbreak. Governor Floyd at Virginia in his legislative message on December 6, 1831, like a month later, darkly hinted that the unrest was not confined to the slave. The best evidence obs observed Concerning this in Virginia is a semi literal letter or letter from a white person, William Manny, dated Chesterfield County, August the twenty ninth, eighteen thirty one, to a slave Ben Lee reading My Old Followers by Ben. And this is what Ben said. You will tell acquaintance every servant in Richmond and adjoining counties. They all must be in strict readiness that this occurrence will go through Virginia with the slaves and whites if there had never been an association, a visiting with free and slave. This would never been this would never have been. They are put up by free about their liberty or liberation. I wrote to Norfolk, Amila, Noteway, and to swell other counties to different slaves, but in Bill Miller, Fowler, John Ferguson, and Sobel, other free followers been at Dr. Crump's and a great many gentlemen servants 
how they must act in getting their liberation. They must set a fair to the county or to the city, Richmond, beginning at Shokoe Hill and then going though east, west, north, south, set fires to the bridges. They are about to break out in Gutland and in Mockleburg and several other counties ever short. Now there is a barber here and this place tells that a Methodist of the name Emmon had put a great many servants up to how they should do an act by setting fires to this town. I do wish they may succeed by so doing. We poorly whites can get work as well as slaves or colored this following Edmund. The Methodist said that Judge T.F. is no friend to the free of your Richmond Free Association that your master Watkinson's Lee Buckenberry Johnson Taylor of Norfolk and several other noble delegates is bitterly against them. All servants say that Billy Hickman has just put him up how to do to revenge the whites. Edmund said so. You all ought to get revenge. Every white in this place is scared or secreted except myself and a few others that Methodists have put up great many slaves in this place. What to do? I can tell you so push on boys push on. Your friend Williamson Manny. And let me stop right here for a second. Besides what Miss Manny said, if you look at the other page, how they always try and tie in that day. Most slaves during that time might have got some help from Europeans or white men of them time. It is not really accurate from the readings. And it shows testament that they think that the slave or the Negro male at the time that cannot get organized back then and maybe now today's a little different that he has the inclination to organize himself when he set his mind right to what he wants to attain and achieve. So it did prove evident when they try to find every outbreak, every revolt, they always find that they have to always go back to the source. Did these so-called slaves, these stupid, brute animals, had help? Was there other Europeans plotting to kill other masters so that they could take their slaves and take their land and resource? That is what we call false, and it's not really true. All revolts from up to, it started beginning around 1600s to late 1800s, have proven evident most of all revolts were done by the minds and hands and thoughts of other Negro slaves and free men. So that dispels myth about, you know, Europeans, you know, plot um, helping these slaves get to where they get. So don't believe the hype when you see these movies depicting that there always is a great white hope helping black people, especially in America back then, for anything that they're trying to attain from freedom, liberty. That's not the case. So that dispels that myth. And anybody else want to prove me wrong, you could always leave a comment and present other books. Some of the evidence pointed to whites. Participation or at least sympathies with the plot of slaves in North Carolina. Just after the term rebellions exists, thus Mr. Nathan P. Whitfield of Union County wrote, The governor Mount Front strokes on September 12, 1831, considered 
concerning serious troubles in Sampson and Dalton counties and of uneasiness in his own area leading to the mobilization of the militant. He added as a postscript, I am inclined to believe that the insurrectionary feeling of uh, generally dis disseminating among the blacks in the lower or uh, eastern counties of the state, I have just learned, though I cannot rely on it, that these Moranders are assisted by some rash rationally whites. <clears throat> Later in September, the commander of militants of Hines County, North Carolina, informed the governor that usual nights assembles of slaves have recently occurred. Excitemently, was great. Strong patrols were out every night, and a fresh supply of arms would be welcome. He added, however, that when it came to getting men for patrol duty, difficulties were encountered for. There are many of these counties who are quite refractionary and scarcely can be brought to do their turn of service and their plea are that it is uncertain whether they shall get paid for their service and that they have no slaves of their own. Therefore, ought not to be interrupted about the slaves of others. Finally, a Baltimore publication reporting the plot of North Carolina added the Union or anonymous note that the extensive and organized plea to bring about this isolation and massacre. It may be awful believe was not also confirmed to the slave or altogether confirmed by the slave. With the news of this outbreak, panic flashed through Virginia. The uprising was infection and slaves everywhere became restless or at least it was believed that they had become restless so that the terror monstrosity localized in Virginia spread up to Delaware and through Georgia, across the Louisiana and into Kentucky. This natural led some to believe that Turner had concerned massacres for rebellions over a wider area than of his own county. This governor, Floyd, wrote, from all that has come to my knowledge during this during and since that the affairs I am fully convinced that every black preacher in the whole county east of the Blue Bridge or the Blue Ridge was in the secret of against and retaliation of extents of the insurrection. I think it's greater than will ever appear. A few other contemporary statements of similar purports apparently and some later writers had adopted the same viewpoint. The final authority of this question, however, is Nat Turner himself, and he affirms that the revolt he led was local and that his activities had been confined to his own neighborhood. He added, I see, sir, you doubt my word, but can you not, and the subtitles at the end of this, think the same ideals of strange appearance about this time in the heavens might prompt others as well as myself to this undertaking. In the absence of any evidence of equal weight to the con country or the contrary, one must conclude that Turner possessed the characteristics of a great leader and that he sensed the mood and feelings of the masses of his fellow beings not only in his immediate environment but generally the years immediately preceding his efforts have been marked by a great rambling of discontent and protest tanner acts itself carrying that rambling to a high point caused an eruption throughout the lamps and breath of the slave south which always 
rested on a volcanic of outraged humanity. The Richmond Inquiry of August 26, 1831, while assuring the world that in its city there was no disturbance, no suspicion, no panic, did note the fact that a patrol turned out in our city every night. Two days later, a resident of Richmond wrote to his New York friend, that the question now arise if the slave in that county would murder the whites whether they are not ready to do it any other county in the state and whether the reports that may spread among the slaves in other parts of the state may not excite these or excite those to insurrection that never thought of such a thing before. Somewhat later, a friend of prosecution wanted to know, or a friend of precaution wanted to know, how can a remedy be provided, the safety of our wives and children and their lives be preserved? These thoughts kept recurring and together with the instant stream of other slaves plots and outbursts deployed a truly feverish state of mind a niece of George Washington declared it is like a smothering volcano we know not when or where the flames will burst forth but we know that death in the most heard form threatens us some have died Others have become deranged from apprehension since the South Hampton affairs and a gentleman in Virginia wrote to an acquaintance in Cincinnati. These insurrections have alarmed my wife so as readily to endanger her health. I have not slept without anxiety in their months. Our nights are sometimes spent and listening to noise, a corn song or a hog call had often been the subject of nervousness, terror, and a cat in the dining rooms will banish sleep for the night. There was been and there still is a panic in all the country. I am beginning to lose my courage about the malaration of the South. Our rivals, producers, no preachers, church are like the buildings in which they worship gone in a few years. There is no principle of life. Death is autocratic of slave regions. The Richmond Copler of September 3rd, 1831 contains this paragraph. And it quotes, Some rumors are still afloat, but we know not to what authorities they rest, and we hope they are very much exaggerated as of a dis dep deposit of guns, pistols, and knives being found in Nansenmont, though a late letter from the county says all arm alarms had subside. Yet we now and then hear of a suspect slave taken up in Nansen month and sorry and we hear a report of a patrol going upon an estate in Prince George and upon the overseers pointing out five whom he suspect shouted to or shooting two who were attempted to escape and securing the other three and throwing them into jail. A letter, a little later, were reports of the convictions of about 11 slaves in the three eastern counties of Nance, Amont, Prince Georgia, and Sussex. Then came the arrest 
and subsequently release of 12 in Norfolk and the conviction of one of the Frederick Berg and the jailing of 40 more in Nansamont and reports no doubt greatly exaggerate were co current that two or three thousand Negroes were hiding in the great Desmel swamps which extend from Southampton into North Carolina. The entire manpower of the state of much if not all the military might and factory auxiliary or auxiliary cavalry either in volunteer or regular militant units were pressed into service throughout the tide waters and the paramount areas while the non combatant population moved into garrisons. Fourth or blood house or block house. Two slaves attempt to avoid arrest were shot and killed in Charles City County in September and the next month several slaves in prison and Sussex attempt to escape. One succeeded, one was killed, another severely wounded and the remainder were secured without injury. On Friday, October the 21st, four of them were hung. And the residents of George County and Sussex, Delaware and Eastern and Seafort, Maryland were panic stricken and slaves and these regions were arrested by the scores and we will stop right here so this is only chapter 12 section 1 of what we like to now call the Nat Turner or the Turner Catechism I hope that you enjoyed this um, reading um, be sure out to tune in to the next broadcast while we conclude chapter 12, section 2.